Hey, perfect. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Marketplace Risk Virtual Event Series. My name is Andrea, and I'm the Director of Events and Logistics here at Marketplace Risk. Today, we're very excited to welcome Albert Young, partner at King & Spalding. Our virtual events are designed to help marketplace and sharing economy startups successfully navigate complex risk management, trust and safety, compliance, and legal subject matter so they can avoid distractions in order to focus on launching and growing. Be sure to check out marketplacerisk.com to access hundreds of hours of content, including our master's program, platform podcast, and previous live events. And to subscribe to our newsletter where we keep you updated on everything, including the Marketplace Risk Management Conference in San Francisco and the Sharing Economy Global Summit in London. As we are gearing up for the Mar Marketplace Risk Management Conference in San Francisco on May 17th and 18th, we would like to offer our virtual event attendees a discount and registration. Please use code virtual event 50, all caps, at checkout for 50% off your registration, and we hope to see you there. Thanks for tuning into today's session, Terms of Service and Arbitration Provisions, What to Watch in Upcoming Supreme Court Cases. First, a couple housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded, so the recording will be available for you to access on our website. Second, all attendees have listening capabilities only and are otherwise muted. And third, do submit your questions via the control panel. If we have time at the end, we'll answer as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, please feel free to email us at info at marketplacerisk.com and we'll get your questions answered. Now, without further ado, Albert, over to you. Thanks so much, Andrea. And a quick plug for the conference. Um, it's coming up and it is always a really, really great opportunity. Um, I kind of think of it as an in-house working session for a lot of technology companies, particularly ones that have platforms and marketplaces. And so uh, it's coming up mid-May, definitely sign up. It is, um, I've been a very tight bubble for family reasons, uh, but it will be one of the, the few reasons why I, um, I, I travel for it. So hope to see many of you there. And um, this is kind of like the first installment on many of the types of legal issues that I get asked a lot as somebody who works. Oh. Can you hear Andrea? I just got this weird sound button. Yeah, we can hear. Okay, perfect. I got something that made it, made it look like I had I muted myself. Um, I'll try to do that for swearing. Um, so anyway, hope to see some of you at the conference. Um, but you know, for today, I'm really glad that uh, you were able to join us. Um, this is probably one of the areas where I work the most behind the scenes with my technology clients. Um, and uh, I get so many questions on a regular basis about it because this really is kind of your living document, your legal contract with users and consumers. So some of this will be interesting. Some of this will feel like daily life for many of you. And hopefully a lot of it will be, um, uh, we're gonna focus on some relatively new cases, including some in the US Supreme Court, which have just been argued. So uh, hopefully it'll be something that is useful to you. Andrea, next slide, please. So quick, a little background, uh, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. You saw this in the bio, next slide, please. Just a little quick background on me um, and how I come about this topic. You know, I've had the great privilege of working with a lot of technology clients over the years, and uh, it began with working with a lot of kind of uh, gig economy, just real innovators and disruptors like Lyft, Airbnb, Ease, which is a cannabis website. Um, and kind of over time, that's kind of grown to other types of marketplaces and platforms, some e-commerce, some telehealth and most recently uh, communications and social media platforms like Snapchat and TikTok. And one of the things that I've observed from working with lots of different types of companies, first, I'm actually not generally going to talk about um, kind of pending litigation that I'm involved in, so I'm not speaking on behalf of either my law firm or um, frankly for my clients. Uh, these are kind of high level observations as somebody who's kind of in the trenches litigating some of these issues. Uh, I am a litigation partner at King & Spalding. And so, you know, one of the privileges of working with lots of different types of technology clients is actually seeing overlaps in the areas of concern for them. And again, in terms of service and arbitration agreements is one of those interesting areas of overlap. Even if you have vastly different platforms and marketplaces, offering different types of services. Um, as I mentioned, I do both litigation and class action defense. I also do quite a bit of uh, regulatory work. Uh, sometimes if you have, um, say, a local district attorney or, God forbid, a state attorney general that's scrutinizing either your company 
or your business practices, um, it sometimes goes to the heart of how your company operates, and I do that type of regulatory investigation or enforcement as well. Um, so I have that kind of outside counsel experience, the person that you sometimes call when stuff hits the fan, but I also have had the privilege of kind of working short stints in-house at um, technology companies. And so that also gives me the perspective of somebody who maybe a little closer to an in-house counsel is trying to write a terms of service or trying to figure out like, how do we adjust this because our marketing team or our product team uh, wants to kind of either change our user flow or to rewrite portions of the terms of service. So a constant struggle I know, particularly for my uh, friends is how to balance kind of that business need with how how do you anticipate this will play out in a court or if you ever had to enforce this terms of service and we're going to talk about some of those tensions today including uh, don't want to be a Debbie Downer about it but courts are increasingly suspicious of terms of service they are particularly suspicious of the presentation of terms of service on um, on apps or our technological platforms and we're going to talk about reasons why that is the case uh, next slide, please. I think uh, one of the things that, you know, as any good lawyer will do, there are a few caveats before we dive into the, the meat of today. Um, one of the things I love best about this conference and the people who attend webinars like this is that there's a great variability between your companies and your business models. And actually, obviously, it's been a very rough uh, couple of years for uh, everybody. Uh, I used to give a version of this CLE kind of in person, and I would just basically invite a very small group, 15 in-house friends who would come. And in person, there's this real ability to kind of go back and forth and say like, oh, in that case, what if our company have done this? So it's a little harder with this type of platform and this type of webinar. But as Andrea mentioned, there's the chat feature. So uh, feel free to chat um, kind of questions and I will reserve my right to ignore them, uh, mainly if I don't know the answer. Uh, I think um, the one thing to keep in mind is because your platforms and your marketplaces are quite different, some of this will apply more to some of your platforms than others. But I get the sense that many, many companies have terms of service, particularly the types of companies that come to this conference. And so a lot of this will be quite interesting. Um, usually I have a terms of service 101 and I have an arbitration uh, agreement 101, both of which are complex topics and kind of deserve their own hours or sometimes half days actually. Today, however, I'm gonna presuppose that you know some of the basics. So some of the portions I'm gonna go through pretty quickly so that I can get to some of the more recent legal updates. So if for some reason I've moved too quickly past some of the starting principles, uh, I'm pretty easy to find kind of on my law firm's website or through Andrea, feel free to follow up and happy to jump on the phone with you. And of course, no good legal caveat. And by the way, this owl is what came up when I typed in caveat and animal. I don't know why, uh, but you're gonna see a lot of animal pictures. You're gonna see a lot of queer adjacent pictures, so strap in. Uh, none of this will be predictions, particularly for Supreme Court cases where we're waiting for the decision. Uh, obviously, none of this is legal advice, but there will be CLE. And the way that it works is uh, we give you the code at the last five minutes. Uh, so hopefully stick around till the end. And then you're gonna need that code. We're gonna read that either I or Andrea, one of us will remember to read the CLE code that you need to essentially unlock the, um, CLE form if you are a lawyer in need of that credit. So without further ado, why don't we launch into the substance of it. Next slide, please. The way I generally think about this topic is I tell people, look, many companies have terms of services. Don't think about it as just a document that you have in your user flow or on your website. Think of it as your legal contract with a user or a consumer, right? That seems obvious, but I can't tell you how often I get questions where my response will be something like, would you do that with a hard copy contract that you have with somebody, right? There's this kind of ease with terms of services that can sometimes cause uh, companies to kind of just get a little facile with um, how they either change or approach what should be considered a legal contract. And when you think about something as a legal contract, um, there are really two elements to it. Obviously, the second part, what are the actual substantive terms 
in a terms of service, you know, we're talking about what the actual words mean, what, what do they mean in terms of users' legal rights and the company's legal defenses. But there's this whole first half of things, which is how. How does somebody enter this legal contract? How did you present them with the contract? And then how did you obtain consent to that legal contract, okay? So whenever I walk uh, clients through this process, I have them think about both because, you know, spoiler alert, if you ever had to go to court, you have to establish both elements, that you were able to prove actual consent through evidence, and then you have to defend what was consented to. So that's how we're gonna to approach today's webinar as well. The first half will be what are the different user flows, consent flows, uh, and what have courts been saying about those recently, and then what. What are people consenting to, and what are some of the ways, particularly the plaintiff's bar, has been aggressive or creative in trying to peel back arbitration agreements, okay? Next slide, please. So when I do the arbitrage, uh, excuse me, the terms of service 101, um, I sometimes, uh, particularly for newer, uh, newer startups who are just kind of coming, coming to design their user flows, um, I tell them that there are lots of different ways. Uh, I, I don't think that is my screen, Andrea, but maybe you can see that on your screen. Hmm. Okay, I don't think that's my screen, so I have to worry about it. Um, the thing to keep in mind when we are talking about kind of different types of consent or user flows is there is slight disagreement even amongst courts about what term or what name to use for what type of online agreement, okay? So I'm gonna actually focus a little bit more on the legal principles so you understand the kind of conceptual differences. These are terms that come from some cases but a lot of it is kind of how I explain uh, different types of consent to technology companies. And so don't get super hung up on, is that exact word the right one for this exact thing? Focus a little bit more on the general principles, which is usually what courts look at. And this is probably a good time for me to flag what might be obvious to you, but is very obvious to me as somebody who is defending your terms of service in litigation and frankly, in front of a judge who's asking very hard questions about your terms of service and your click wraps. You're gonna hear that term in a little bit. You probably design your apps for a younger user base than constitute uh, a state or federal judge. I'm just gonna name that out loud. And the reason this becomes an issue is because even if you're like, oh, young people, they don't mind that, or young people can read that, that's not how it always plays out in front of an older judge. Uh, I get a lot of questions, for example, about font size. Um, I get a lot of questions about how clear is it, how conspicuous is it? So let's just name right up front that even if you are generally thinking about the business needs, with your user base. You also want to keep in the back of your head if you actually had to defend this legal contract in a court, who is the age and demographic of the person who is scrutinizing your user flow, okay? So with that in mind, here are four categories that I'm going to walk you through. And I'm going to walk you through, in general, what I think is gold to least gold standard in terms of obtaining consent. Next slide, please. Um, and again, these are names that have some basis in cases, but don't get super hung up on the name, focus on the principles. Scroll wrap, the easiest way that I use to describe this is what a lot of people associate with the uh, Apple Music iTunes terms of service. I think most of you have signed some version of it. It's the one where on the very first page, it's a big page with a whole bunch of legal terms. and You can't even click the agree button at the bottom until you scroll down to the bottom, right? And so many people have seen the iTunes one. This is a quintessential example of what is called a scroll wrap. And you can see why it's called a scroll wrap. It's because while you are not obligated in some cases to scroll through the whole thing, though you know Apple for a while did require you to scroll through the whole thing to unlock the button. But the idea is that on the first page, you are presented the terms and have the opportunity to scroll through the full legal contract. This is a very, very clear way to courts 
um, yes, this, this, it's really no reasonable dispute that a user or a consumer knew that they were entering a legal contract. There's no surprise factor. And the numbers here, they're a little bit outdated because I can't, I can't update this every year because it involves reading a lot of cases. But a few years ago, when we did a survey of federal court decisions, looking at terms of services, you know, 12 courts basically said, yeah, when it's presented like this on the first page and you have an opportunity to read, it, we don't have a problem with how you obtained consent this way. The silver standard, what I, people use the term click wrap, but I use it really to refer to kind of the silver standard of um, online agreements. And here is how I would think about this. Here, the, they're not on the very first page, but you can see you can either click a button or you can click a hyperlink and very easily get to the legal terms if you want to read them and you want to understand them, right? They're just not presented necessarily on the first page as with a scroll wrap, but it's still considered a click wrap because the button, the affirmative manifestation of consent is very, very clear. It says in this example, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree very clearly signifies to a user, hey, you are consenting to something and then the presentation of the hyperlink says you are agreeing to a legal contract okay so if it has this element of a very clear legal consent um, i call it a click wrap um, the majority of courts will also enforce this type of presentation you can see in the 33 to 7 record now the reason i call it silver standard is because when we did this survey, seven courts were like, eh, we still don't love this. Why didn't you present it in the very first screen like the iTunes one? So you do run a little bit more risk if you kind of go to what I would call a click wrap presentation. But over time, um, the case law has developed even since we did the survey where more and more courts are acknowledging that click wraps are probably a reasonable way to present terms of service. Next slide, please. Now we're getting into, I would say, bronze standard, okay? And the reason this is called a sign-in wrap is because maybe the button doesn't very clearly signify that you're entering a legal contract. Maybe it doesn't say the word agree, or it doesn't say the word accept. You, and, and actually, some of the times, what you're asking a user to do is consent to a legal contract while doing something else. Take a look at the screen and look closely. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this screen and in fact gone through this screen before if you've purchased anything online before. But the relevant button here is the one that says place your order. Do you see that on the right right there? That place your order refers to look to the left, the upper left. Do you see where underneath review your order it says by placing your order you agree to Amazon's privacy policy and conditions of use? This is a little bit below the previous screen because place your order is slightly more ambiguous than agree or accept. And that's a little further removed from the notice that, oh, by the way, when you place your order, you are also entering a legal, legal uh, contract, right? The reason sometimes this is called a sign-in wrap is many of you actually do this on your initial user account creation screens, okay? I think a lot of you say, give us your email, uh, give us maybe a phone number if that's required. And then it says, you know, account, like create or sign in or register. That's what the button says. And what you are hoping is that the user, when they click your button, even though they're creating an account, that they simultaneously understand that they're entering a legal contract for that account, okay? As you can see, the, the further down we go in this kind of rubric, the more judges are suspicious about what exactly the users knew and didn't know. So just keep that in mind. I do have clients who are kind of argue that sign-in wraps are really the risk level that they're willing to accept. And so just understand that if your product teams are pushing you in this direction, you should make clear to them that you run an increasing risk of a court just not liking it and saying, we don't think that the user had enough notice here, okay? I'm gonna quickly do the fourth one. Next slide, please. There is something technically called a browse wrap, but it is so offensive to me, I'm not gonna show you what it is because why bother? There's really no reason. You're actually familiar with this contract. 
it's kind of the thing where you see on a website that says, by visiting our website, you agree to our terms. You've done nothing affirmative to manifest your consent as the visitor to the website. There's no button. There's not even a button that says continue next or anything. Basically, the company is hoping that if you simply browse the website, that you've agreed to the terms of service. This is so unreliable. I never recommend um, that, the, that companies ever do this. So many court cases are extremely harsh about it. And uh, The Rock agrees with me. That's why he's here. So I think the way to think about this is, why would you put in all of the effort, your in-house legal hours, your outside counsel spend, to crafting these very, very tight legal terms when a court can just sidestep the whole thing and said, no, you had no idea that simply browsing was sufficient here. So I would never recommend a browse wrap. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna start the actual cases actually with a very recent decision just this year, 2022. To me, when this decision came down, it was not surprising. It actually kind of summarizes a lot of legal principles that I've been talking with clients about for years, but I do think it's important because first it came down from the Ninth Circuit, uh, and that's the circuit, the federal circuit that is in charge of most of the West, including California. And also because I think it illustrates kind of, I get so many questions along the lines of, well, what if we put the language here? What if we make it a little bit smaller? Why do we need a checkbox? What if the button says something different? And I want you just to kind of see a real world example of how a company got majorly, majorly screwed because, you know, they were just kind of cutting corners on their kind of online presentation process, okay? So now the underlying case doesn't really involve the type of technology company that would come to this conference, but I think the principles are relevant, okay? So this is a case called Berman versus Freedom Financial and it involved a third party marketer. And the third party marketer, um, Look, I have a separate CLE where I talk about marketing, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's a very high risk statute. And so third party marketers, surprise, they're really good at selling you their services as a vendor, uh, but they don't always uh, have the cleanest business operations. And so if you're outsourcing your marketing to these people, be real careful about what you do and really, really scrutinize them with your in-house counsel and your outside counsel. In this particular case, I'm actually not gonna talk about their marketing practices because this Ninth Circuit case was really about their terms of service and the, their kind of agreement process, the consent flow. Now, take a close look at this screenshot, okay? And apologies to any Stephanie's out there, uh, but this is a screenshot from the case. Now, take a look at it, and where do you think that a user agreed to something uh, in this user flow, okay? I know some of you are doing this, right? And you're just looking real carefully. You probably see a checkbox that says, I agree. First of all, the fact that you had to lean in, think about how that looks to a judge who's over 50 or 60. Secondly, what is the person agreeing to there? If you were able to read more closely, and I'm not sure I can, thank goodness I have a blown up screen over here. The actual screenshot, if you look at it, says, I agree to receive daily emails from company company. So the button that requires affirmative consent is actually affirmative consent to marketing. The terms of service language is above that. Do you see that? That, that skinny little anorexic sentence that says, I understand and agree to hyperlink terms and conditions. The court said, nah. -uh. First of all, even if I agree were enough and that font size were enough, the only thing that somebody technically agreed to was marketing, not to a legal contract in the form of terms and conditions. Next slide, please. Um, this gets worse. You can't even just lean in, break out your magnifying glasses for this one. I will read this to you. You know, the company said, well, hold on. If you didn't like that earlier screen, take a look at this screen, right? <laughs> so if you really lean in closely, do you see where the continue button is? Above the continue button is similar language. I understand and agree to the terms of service hyperlink, okay? Does a person do something next to it, like a little checkbox? You know how there's a dedicated checkbox sometimes that says, yes, I understand and agree? No, there's no dedicated anything next to the terms and conditions sentence. 
what there is is that bright green continue button, right? And some of you who are my clients have heard me rail on and on about continue and next buttons and why I hate them. This is a perfect example, right? This is a recent, I think it's a February case where a very important court said, yeah, we really don't think that's enough for you. And here in this case, there was both lack of clarity with the button itself, but also there's really no connection to the I understand and agree above that. So this company will have, you know, they thought that they had a terms of service and an arbitration agreement, but a very important court said, no, we don't think that a user really had sufficient notice for you to now enforce it. So people have put in all this work into a terms of service and are going to be really, really disappointed. Uh, we're talking like a million dollars, like millions of dollars, right? For these TCPA class actions, we're millions of dollars of potential liability here because probably a product team was like, eh, no one cares about this. Well, these judges did. Next slide, please. So that's a recent case. It came out really, really recently. I, I, I suggest that you read it because it will really give you a sense of what I tend to feel when I'm on the, frankly, the firing line, when I'm defending your terms of service in court. It's such a different conversation than the conversation that internal business teams have, right? Um, and so it's important to read it and have a very stark and realistic understanding about how, um, how a court, particularly an older judge, might view these issues. I'm gonna also then go through some other recent cases. We're gonna go by these pretty quickly because you're gonna see a lot of the principles that we talked about in the Freedom Financial case kind of come to bear with other, frankly, more uh, technology company type cases. Next slide, please. So one of the first lessons I, 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 I I mentioned to, to companies, both new companies, but also kind of more sophisticated companies. Courts don't agree amongst themselves. Do you remember that screenshot earlier involving the Amazon purchase flow? Um, there's a famous example where two different courts in two different parts of the country looked at the exact same screenshot, right? One of which said, oh yeah, place your order, that's probably enough. And another court said, I don't know what place your order means and why does that tell me it's a legal contract? So two different courts can look at the exact same screen or a similar screen and reach different decisions. Why does that matter to you as a business? It's because a lot of times it's very easy for product teams to kind of rush to the lowest common denominator, but you can't assume that at that level, everybody's gonna agree. So here are two recent screenshots. Uh, actually, these are older screenshots, excuse me. But two different courts looked at, see, see that little checkbox? There's a dedicated checkbox, right? It's not like a free floating sentence, but there's a dedicated checkbox where a user affirmatively has to check it to move on in the user flow. And it says, I agree to terms of service, hyperlink, okay? So that's not bad. That would, in my kind of nomenclature, be kind of that silver level uh, click wrap, right? Because it's a dedicated affirmative manifestation of consent to a legal contract. And yet two different courts reach different decisions about this checkbox, okay? So keep in mind that courts are fickle. And a lot of the time, the analysis, if you read some of these cases, comes down to two Cs, clutter and conspicuousness. Is the user being asked to do a lot of things, like give you their phone number and their credit card? Uh, or are they really focused on the fact that they're agreeing to illegal terms? And the conspicuousness, right? How big is the font? How bright is it? And if you want to depend or hinge your terms of service on how a random judge kind of views the clutter and conspicuousness of your consent screen, that's a high level of variability and risk, and I generally advise against it. Next slide, please. Now, full disclosure, I was involved in the case to the left. Um, I represented T, uh, Ease in a uh, TCPA class action where this was the kind of consent screen by the user. And you can see, again, there is a dedicated checkbox there that says, I agree to join the following collectives and consent to ease as terms of service, okay? And even though the button says sign up, okay, we made a twofold argument. We said, first of all, there's a dedicated checkbox here. So that alone is sufficient. Even if you don't like a button that says sign up, right? a sign in wrap, there is a dedicated checkbox. So we actually tried to push it more in the direction of a click wrap. And then we said, and by the way, sign up, the button is uh, supportive of this concept. And so, um, because unlike say, like a button later in the user flow, we argued that users 
generally understand that we're signing up for the first time or creating an account for the first time, they are on heightened alert that they're entering a legal contract. And we actually won this argument. And so that's a good example of how, especially the dedicated checkbox was quite helpful, but then take a look at the next one. In the other case, the Anand case, the court said, no, the continue button says nothing. It's too disconnected to, I understand. And even though this Illinois case was in 2019, think about how this compares to the Berman case that I cited earlier, right? Two years later, a court still hates the continue button. So I generally tell companies to be very careful before relying on continue and next buttons. High, high uh, degree of unreliability there. Next slide, please. The last ones I'm gonna march through pretty quickly um, because they involve, um, again, you have to be really, really risk tolerant, right? Um, I hear all the time, friction. Uh, product teams are just trying to reduce friction so it's easier for users to make it through the user process. The thing that you need to keep in mind is that whatever business reason there may be to reduce user friction, from a court's perspective, this is one of the few places that they like friction. To a court, friction sounds like, oh, the user stopped, the user slowed down and had an opportunity to review the legal contract and then still went forward with the user flow. So there's an inherent tension. You're gonna hear that term a lot if you're a product counsel, but you have to keep in mind that how business folks look at it is a little bit different than how a court would look at it. Because in this Colgate case, for example, do you see where it says at the bottom, by registering with Jewel Labs, you agree, right? And that's a similar sign up button as you saw in some of the earlier screens, court struck this down. And here's the interesting thing that the court said. The court said, look at above where it says forget password. Do you see that? That clearly is underlined. And the court went on this kind of long discussion about like, well, if it's underlined, it's a little bolder. And also more people understand that underlined texts, at least on apps, are hyperlinks. Terms and conditions, it was a hyperlink, but it wasn't underlined. Can you imagine kind of millions of dollars in your terms of service depending on underlined text? But that's the risk you take if you kind of reduce the amount of friction that a user might see. Next slide, please. But then later in other litigation against Juul, when Juul had kind of improved their, their screen, um, and, and I obviously doctored this a little bit because I couldn't find the revised image, but basically they added a checkbox and they underlined and changed the color of the terms and conditions. That same court said, yes, this is much more clear. We will enforce this. Okay, uh, next slide, please. I mean, again, if you have to come down to the color and the underlying of your hyperlink, that is a lot of risk for you to be taking. You know, why not just, you know, have much more clear buttons that say agree and accept, which most courts understand are a little bit heightened notice. Um, I think actually you can skip this slide. Basically, the court allowed, uh, allowed things to move forward. That's the main point of this slide. And then the last case is really a procedural matter, particularly for the in-house counsel here. It's very important that when you go into court to defend your online agreement or your click wrap, that you actually submit sufficient evidence. So how did you, how are you able to prove that a particular user or plaintiff saw a particular version of your signup screen or your user flow? So one of the things I recommend, particularly for companies that are developing, even if they don't have in-house counsel, to screen capture every time that you change your consent screen, your consent screen to your terms of service. Just keep a repository, right? It doesn't have to be the fanciest thing, but every time you roll out a new product update or version update, somebody should be screen capturing as of January 1st, you know, 2022, this is what a user would have seen on their app. A lot of times, and I know this is how tech companies work, you kind of outsource some of this programming and then you have to ask maybe a third party like, hey, what did our own user consent flow look like at the time? That's not really ideal in litigation for you to depend on third party to prove what your own app looked like. So here, basically somebody struck down Eventbrite's motion to compel arbitration because they didn't have sufficient evidence of what that user would have seen at the moment that they entered the contract, okay? So there was a lot of case law, but you can see the theme through all of it is not like, oh, underlining always works, or oh, a button is always works. 
That's really not what I would take away from it. What you should take away consistently from the cases is heightened scrutiny and skepticism by courts about how technology companies present their online agreements. So when you're thinking about the how, the first half of our presentation, think about those issues, okay? Just balance it with whatever you're hearing from your business and product teams. Now, let's shift to really the second half and the what, and here's where the Supreme Court is gonna come in a little bit more, okay? Next slide, please. I just walked you through kind of how do you obtain consent the next step in any analysis, if you were to go into court and try to enforce your terms of service is, well, okay, we believe you. The user knew it was a legal contract and in fact agreed. Maybe they pressed a little dedicated checkbox. Maybe they pressed a button that said agree or accept. But what exactly did it, they agree to? Let's all acknowledge this is, uh, they've grown longer over the years in part because companies like yours are trying to kind of explain more about their platform, what they do and don't do. They're often, disclaimers, there are limitations of liability, lots of things go into a terms of service. I'm happy to talk offline if you know uh, you have particular issues with yours. But I will tell you that 80 to 90 percent of the conversations I have with clients, uh, very sophisticated clients who are designing their terms of service, really focus on one particular clause, and that's the arbitration agreement. And the reason this is very important is twofold. One, this is probably the clause in your terms of service that gets litigated the most. Um, I represent a lot of technology companies and a lot of different issues, but this is what's considered a threshold defense. If you as a company can say, look, our contract was very clear about this. And one of the things that was clear about is how we resolve disputes with the user who's trying to sue us. Um, the arbitration agreement is very, very important. The other reason that it's actually, we spend so much time thinking through every company's arbitration strategy, and companies differ, okay, on what they're willing to say in their arbitration agreements. The reason is because it's a very quickly developing area of law. I think the US Supreme Court has taken one to three arbitration cases almost every year for the last decade. Now, compared to the first half of our presentation where we were talking about how the user flows, the, like there's not very much, at least at the US Supreme Court level, they don't tend to get into the weeds of like this kind of visual presentation of user flow, but there's a lot of law and it's quickly developing law on the issue of arbitration. So again, um, this would deserve its own kind of primer 101 about what are the basics of it, but I'm gonna presuppose a starting level of knowledge. I think most of you uh, either know, or if you look on your own terms of service, if you, kind of word search for it, uh, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll see the term Federal Arbitration Act. The FAA is the kind of big federal law that basically says, um, we're going to put arbitration agreements, which are a form of contract, on the same level as other types of contracts that we like. And so the Federal Arbitration Act, the FAA, strikes a very bold and broad policy in favor of arbitration which usually is individual in nature, okay? Most arbitration um, agreements have what are called a class or group action waiver that essentially says, if you have a dispute, we will have the dispute with you, we will go to private arbitration and we'll try to work out the dispute, but in the process of doing so, you agree that you're actually not gonna try to represent other people. You can have your dispute with us, we will have it in arbitration, but you are waiving your right to participate in a class action, maybe a collective action under the FLSA, and maybe, we're gonna talk about this, a representative action, where you're trying to represent other uh, workers or employees, or you're trying to represent people on behalf of the state of California, for example. So I'm actually, next slide please, I'm going to talk, uh, we can't kind of go over all the basics, but I'm gonna focus you on three recent cases that certainly I'm paying attention to and I'm talking a lot with my clients about. Um, the other reason I kind of think arbitration agreements take up so much oxygen within the terms of service is because, um, because it's a quickly developing area of law, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and I think courts, you know, state courts have a slightly different view than federal courts, even within federal courts, there's slightly different levels of favoring of arbitration agreements. There are times where I get asked to parachute in only to a motion to compel arbitration or to kind of um, help assist with strategy as to like what are the best arguments to make because the plaintiff's bar has really 
struggled to figure out like, okay, the FAA and the US Supreme Court has really made it harder and harder to bring class actions. And so what can we do to circumvent some of this favorable law? Okay, so part of what we're gonna talk about in our remaining minutes together is how the plaintiffs, uh, particularly plaintiffs lawyers, have gotten extremely aggressive and extremely creative in trying to exploit loopholes in federal arbitration law and what could be happening in terms of courts responding to them. And I'm gonna focus on three cases in particular. There's a huge body of law. We are only tip of the iceberg, but these are recent ones that I'm certainly paying a lot of attention to. Um, and you're probably looking at these three uh, kind of <laughs> names of cases and you're like, Albert, these aren't tech companies. Why does this matter to us? Well, I will explain as we go. And next slide, please. Okay, first case, delicious. Southwest Airlines versus Saxon. And uh, this involves, uh, if you think about kind of an airline, you know how there are ramps where, um, I, I think it could either be the ramp where you walk up, but I also think it's the ramp where essentially luggage gets loaded onto an airplane. And uh, the question is, Saxon, who is a supervisor of ramp workers, um, she attempted to sue Southwest Airlines and represent others uh, in kind of a class action. And Southwest Airlines said, hey, we have an arbitration agreement. We can have an individual dispute with you in arbitration, but you can't uh, really represent uh, other, other folks. And Saxon had a very, very um, creative uh, plaintiff's counsel who said, ah, 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 you are relying on the Federal Arbitration Act, but there is an express exemption in the Federal Arbitration Act for what some of us call transportation worker or interstate transportation worker. That's kind of a colloquial term but the full term is at the very bottom of the screen. And I know what some of you are thinking, you're like, Albert, that font is really hard for me to read. Keep that in mind the next time you come to me with kind of uh, user flow questions and font size, but I will read it for you. The actual statutory exemption is for contracts of employment for seamen, railroad employees, or any other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. And that's like a mouthful. So that's why some of us shorthand it as interstate transportation worker, okay? And the question in this case is, does a ramp agent for an airline fit somewhere within this narrow exception? Now, there's general agreement that this exception was to avoid kind of the exception swallowing the rule was meant to be somewhat narrow and definitely historic, right? It's referencing ships, it's referencing, referencing railroads. Actually, you'll see airlines are not specifically referenced here, right? And so what is interesting is the design of this, um, kind of this text is a big part of this case. Like for example, um, seamen are generally historically thought of as the people who work on a ship, okay? So that if you are, somebody for the same company, but you never work on the ship that moves interstate, no one's gonna call, say, um, you know, an assistant who kind of works in the office, but never gets on board the ship, a seaman, okay? And by the way, let's take a pause here to all be grateful that um, when I was Google searching for images on this case, that this is the image that I landed on uh, when the legal questions are things like, what is the history of semen? Um, but that's generally one of the questions that was actually asked at the oral argument recently, right? Because the, the justices are really trying to figure out if this is a narrow and historic exception, what could have fallen into what Congress was thinking at the time? Take a look at the second word, railroad employees. There is more of an understanding that this is a broader term because you don't have to work on the train that is moving to be considered a railroad employee. Maybe the assistant in that railroad company might fall within that category. But then what do you do about this third, what's called residual clause? Who falls under other class of workers engaged in foreign and interstate commerce, right? So it's it, it, happy to talk offline about kind of the weird textual arguments here. Very interesting discussions about what types of transportation are meant to be included here, what types of workers, and then what type of roles are happening. 
But I think the question you're probably asking right now is, Albert, how does this help us? We're technology companies, we're not even an airline or a railroad company. What does this mean for us? Well, first you should know that some gig economy companies actually did file amicus briefs in this case. Uh, Lyft and Uber filed, I believe. And the reason that it becomes relevant for marketplaces like yours is because if you are on the receiving end of a labor or a wage and hour lawsuit, a creative plaintiff may have said to you, ah, 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 you are offering to connect me with workers, but I think your workers are somehow participating in interstate commerce. So one of the questions that's raised in these lawsuits, and that is being raised by these US Supreme Court cases, you know, what does your terms of service say about the workers? Do they fall under this narrow exception for class of workers in foreign or interstate commerce? And so the reason a lot of us are paying attention to this case is because, not because necessarily that any of us think of ourselves as falling within the historic industries, but because plaintiffs' councils are being very, very creative about using it against technology companies to try to circumvent arbitration altogether. And I'm going to give an example that I was involved in, hence the picture. Um, I was counsel of record in McGee versus Postmates. And this was, I believe, the first COVID class action that had been filed against, co uh, against Postmates. And there, a courier said, hey, I don't think that you gave me enough PPE. I think you misclassified me as an independent contractor. All of these wage and hour violations. And actually, the plaintiff in that case tried to take advantage of the same transportation worker exemption and said, and by the way, don't even bother trying arbitration against me because I think I fall within this uh, this exception. And there was a lot of kind of briefing on this issue, right? Um, one of the things that we did is we pointed to Postmates' own terms of service. And the terms of service was quite clear. What you're essentially getting is you're getting a local transaction to a local restaurant or a local merchant, right? Um, because some of the case law says, well, what if, um, what if goods are kind of shipped interstate as part of a interstate supply chain? You know, does that, potentially fall under this narrow exception. And uh, a sentence that I'm very proud of having uh, written, um, and this was actually cited when um, we were named Transportation Group of the Year. Uh, this was one of the cases that was part of the commendation, is we explained in briefing, um, just because you can ship chicken cross state doesn't mean that the chicken cacciatore that you order from a local restaurant is an interstate transaction, right? Like, I think everyone has an intuitive understanding that whatever raw poultry gets shipped interstate, it comes to rest, maybe at a supermarket, maybe at a local restaurant, and lots of things happen to the poultry that eventually transforms it into a totally different thing when it's the chicken cacciatore in this. And so I think that was helpful for the court to understand kind of this distinction, and the court agreed with us that um, the claim had to be arbitrated. Next slide, please. The second Supreme Court case that I'm paying attention to, and hopefully you are paying attention to, is the Viking River Cruise versus Mariana uh, case. It was argued only two days after the Saxon case, so um, lots of arbitration oral arguments happening in, this, in, in March. Um, both decisions are expected this term, which will end June, so that's one reason we're paying attention to it. And um, this concerns the enforceability of PAGA waivers. And, um, I know you're wondering about the picture too. When I Googled, um, you know, gay crews, this is kind of what came up. And I assume that they're all kind of saying high five and saying, yay, arbitration. I think that's what they were talking about. That's what I would probably talk about in a gay cruise, but I, I can't say for sure. But this case involved Viking River cruises. And basically they tried to assert their arbitration agreement against somebody who brought a PAGA lawsuit against them. And I'm gonna do this part really quickly. This is a private attorney general lawsuit where a uh, you know, putative employee says, I get to stand in the place of the state, the state, California's uh, attorney general, and basically sue for labor code violations on behalf of others who are similarly situated. Now, the weird quirk about this case is that, as I've said, there is kind of a lot of federal case law, including from the US Supreme Court that says, you know what, it's okay for individuals to waive their right to participate in class actions within an arbitration agreement. The California Supreme Court, um, a few years ago actually, articulated kind of a loophole or an exception to it. It's sometimes known as the Iskanian rule because that was the name of the case 
where the California Supreme Court announced this. And the reasoning from the California Supreme Court was the following. They said, look, private attorney general actions, PAGA, um, they're kind of different than class actions that the US Supreme Court are talking about. We think this was the California legislature's way to give kind of a, a special right to workers. And so um, we don't think that's what the US Supreme Court meant. So th there's a PAGA carve out or a PAGA loophole that permits those claims from being sent to arbitration. Uh, despite the California Supreme Court kind of articulating that, I think a lot of companies kept arbitration agreements, even in California. And oftentimes the waiver kind of reads like class action, collective action, or representative action. Kind of the idea is the individuals waiving lots of different types of representative or class actions, or another way to think about it is a group action. And so here basically what happened was there's a fight with uh, somebody who worked for Viking River Cruises and Viking said, look, we, we don't have a problem with waiving PAGA lawsuits and Moriana, you know, actually this bubbled up through California state courts and California state court said, hey, look, California Supreme Court has already made this clear. So when the US Supreme Court finally took this case for review, a lot of us, particularly who defend companies, thought, oh, the US Supreme Court is finally paying attention to this loophole. And probably the reason that they are finally paying attention to this loophole is because they might close it, or they might at least narrow this kind of carve out that the California Supreme Court has articulated. Because it, it really took a, several years and it's kind of created havoc for a lot of your companies. I know some of your companies face PAGA lawsuits. And so we thought that there was some, uh, some movement that would be happening once this case was taken. Interestingly, after the March 30th oral argument, I actually read mixed coverage about how um, prognosticators thought the case was gonna turn out. Um, some said, oh, you know, this, this, the oral argument didn't sound very encouraging despite the Supreme Court taking the case. Others said, yeah, there were some interesting questions raised, but there still seems to be a majority that's in favor of striking down the California loophole. Because I started by saying, I'm not gonna give legal advice for predictions. I'm not gonna say uh, for certain how it's gonna, uh, you know, what the result is gonna be, but you should be paying attention to this case. And the thing to keep in mind is, because of different justices having slightly different um, jurisprudence and worldview about arbitration, um, there could be different alignments where different justices say different things and there are multiple concurrences in this case. Um, so really you should be paying attention to this and then talking with your in-house counsel or your outside counsel, especially if you have a PAGA lawsuit about what the Supreme Court case could mean for you. We're expecting a decision uh, anytime in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. The last case is not a Supreme Court case, but I think it's a very interesting and important one. And it was just handed down by the Seventh Circuit, which is a circuit in charge of Illinois and Chicago and some other states. And so um, I, I tricked you. It does not involve KFC, the chicken company, because that would make this like too chicken heavy for a CLE. This actually involves Snapchat, the company. Full disclosure, uh, I represent Snapchat in other litigation, but I was not involved in this case. I'm not talking about anything uh, other than what came out of the public decision. Um, and so in this case, it was actually an underage user who um, was attempting to bring a class action saying, hey, I think you um, collected biometric information about me in violation of certain privacy laws. Some of you know BIPA in Illinois. And so they were trying to bring a BIPA class action and what's interesting about this lawsuit is that um, the Snapchat said, look, we have an arbitration agreement with you. And actually the arbitration agreement, if you look at the language says, even early disputes, threshold disputes about what should be covered in arbitration, that gets decided by the arbitrator, not by the court. And um, the plaintiff's attorney made a very aggressive argument that said, ah, 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 because my, plaintiff was a minor at the time that they downloaded the app and agreed to your terms of service, uh, my plaintiff gets to take advantage of a doctrine called disaffirmation. And this is known by some of you. Um, it's the doctrine that essentially, it's kind of based on the idea that if you're underage, it's, you know, 
do you really, are you able to consent to contracts, you know? And so the plaintiff here said, I, I, I disaffirm your terms of service and your arbitration agreement, so you can't use it against me. And so it went, you know, it went up to the Seventh Circuit and the Seventh Circuit said, okay, we understand that you're making a disaffirmation argument, but we still think that could be sent to the arbitrator to be analyzed and adjudicated in the first instance. And the plaintiff said, no, 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 I don't think you understand. I'm saying like, I shouldn't have you know, entered this contract. And so you can't enforce it against me. And there's something wrong about sending me to an arbitrator when there wasn't a contract to send me to the arbitrator. The Seventh Circuit uh, made this really interesting distinction and it clarified some things that some of us who've been litigating arbitrations have been arguing. It's this distinction between a void versus a voidable arbitration contract. The Seventh Circuit said, okay, we understand what you're saying. You're saying that after you enter the contract, this disaffirmation doctrine allows you later to disaffirm, oh, you know, you can't enforce it against me later as an adult or whatever. That's not the same thing. Trying to, making it voidable later doesn't necessarily mean that it was void in the moment that you formed the contract. And so there's this jurisprudence that distinguishes between void versus voidable contracts. And essentially the Seventh Circuit said, you can raise this argument, but it doesn't this argument is really about the enforceability or what is covered under the arbitration contract. It's not quite the same as saying, I never entered it in the first place at the time that I entered it, or it's not the same thing as saying, I never formed a arbitration agreement. So this is a really interesting uh, decision. Uh, it's an important decision because the Seventh Circuit is an important circuit. And so go read the decision because, first of all, many of your terms of service actually describe what you do with minor users and how people are not permitted to use your apps or your platforms below a certain age level. But secondly, you want to talk with your in-house or outside counsel about wait, does our arbitration agreement actually delegate threshold issues? Because if you didn't have a delegation clause, this case wouldn't be very helpful to you because the court decides everything. And then the court would decide the disaffirmation doctrine. But here the Seventh Circuit said Snapchat's arbitration agreement was quite clear that even early threshold issues, like what is enforceable within the arbitration agreement, can get decided by the arbitrator in the first instance. So this came down recently, take a look at it. I think it's very interesting. Um, I think, next slide please, we're at the end of our time. I know we covered a lot of territory in a lot of cases. Um, again, don't hesitate to reach out if uh, you have specific issues that you want to think through. I'm so appreciative that people took some time from their day to chat through a lot of nerdery, um, a lot of animal pictures, um, and I'll leave a little time. Oh, we have actually the CLE code, probably what many of you have been pulling your breath for. The CLE code, which you need to fill in on the form that you're gonna get from Andrea is KS-CLE-22-81. One more time, KS-CLE-22-81. So fill that in on your form. We have a couple of minutes. Oh, oh actually, Andrea, take us away. Awesome, thank you, Albert. And everyone, you can actually find the CLE handout in the chat under handouts. And if anyone has any issues, you can email us at info at marketplacerisk.com and I can send it along as well. But it is here for everyone. Please be sure to read, it's in the footer, which states the CLE is applicable for. And Albert, I just wanna say thank you so much for your presentation today. Do you have any final remarks before I close this out? No, I uh, hope to see you all at the conference. Awesome. And thank you everyone for joining us today. As a reminder, check out marketplacerisk.com to access this recording along with hundreds of hours of content and to subscribe to our newsletter and to stay up to date on all events. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.